Hi there, good morning, um, Sarepta Church. Alan Blackman has invited me to share with you this Sunday morning. And it's my honor uh, um, to share God's word once again with you. I really have enjoyed my times of, of um, being with you, albeit virtually <laughs> in this way. But let me share with you, especially after the uh, past pain in our country in the last 10 or 12 days of uh, terrible violence and all the looting and the death of, they say now, 217 people with over 17 billion rands worth of damage and looting in our country. It's really been very discouraging, very heartrending to see the images um, on TV. And at a time of extremity and crisis like this, um, especially as followers of Jesus, we need to find how to respond as God wants us to respond. So um, as part of Freedom House uh, Church, together with the leadership, we wrote a little document, a pastoral statement and letter to our people, guiding them in a response. And I just want to share some of that. I've always worked from Psalm 11 in moments of societal breakdown and national crisis. And I found Psalm 11, among other Psalms, a great way of praying our feelings and perceptions and experiences and trauma and releasing them to God and in it finding a, a creative and redemptive faith-filled response in, uh, in moments like this in our nation and also personally in terms of personal crisis and family crisis. So I'm going to just share with you from Psalm 11. I trust that, it, that you find it really meaningful, encouraging and uh, directive in terms of how you can face what's going on in our country. But let me just first of all pray. Lord Jesus, once again, we are so honored and privileged to, to be together in your presence, even though it's via video and the internet. But Lord, we know that you are present. You are present with everyone who's listening to this, this message this morning. Jesus, head of your church, we ask you to pour your Holy Spirit upon us afresh and to teach us your ways and your truth. Give us your mind, Lord Jesus, but even beyond giving us your mind in this time of crisis and uncertainty, give us your heart, your heart of compassion, your heart of courage, your heart of faith, that we may see and know what you are doing at this time, and that we may respond with you in what you are doing in South Africa, that we may be a redemptive presence to those around us, to our neighbors, to our communities. So come, Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, through your word, let your word become alive and sharp and let it penetrate to the deepest recesses of our hearts and of our minds and cutting away that which is not of you and establishing that which is really of you, giving life. Come, Lord, by your word and your spirit, and speak to us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. So, Psalm 11, David, this psalm was written by David, and I find such enormous comfort and strength by praying the psalms. I encourage you, my brothers and my sisters, that when you experience personal difficulty and challenges and issues, and you have choices to make. And when you as a family and as a community, even a local church community, experiences challenges and difficulties. And as a society, as a nation, turn to God through praying the Psalms. We need to learn to pray the Psalms. You know, most of the Psalms are actually laments to God. Both personal laments and community laments. And as evangelical charismatics, Pentecostals... I think we've lost the ability 
to lament in a constructive way, to, to cry out our pain, to bring our feelings, our perceptions, our emotions, our trauma, our challenges to God in a very constructive, healthy way, as opposed to letting it turn inward and then we implode, it poisons us, it, it affects our perceptions of reality, it, it warps our perceptions of reality. And unprocessed emotions, unresolved emotions that are pushed down actually do affect our psyche and our bodies and uh, can make us sick and depressed. So the Psalms is, our, is the God-given way to Israel and to all of God's people in the New Covenant because Jesus prayed the Psalms all the time. The Psalms is our way of responding to life's challenges and making choices with God in the midst of our challenges. And here is a, a real case in point in terms of what's happened in South Africa. So Psalm 11, David wrote, and he wrote it in a time of extremity. And in all likelihood, he wrote it when, when um, Saul was pursuing him to actually take his life. Because there's a key phrase here in the psalm that is uh, directly uh, referred to in 1 Samuel chapter 26. Um, so what I'm going to do is read Psalm 11 and share a meditation and some, bring out some points to strengthen our hearts at this time from Psalm 11. And I, then I'll refer to this the context where probably David um, wrote the psalm. So David then starts off by saying, and I'm looking up because I'm reading from my monitor just above the camera here, and uh, David says, In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, Flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows, they, they, they set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord is, in his he is on His heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine every person. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. On the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur, like a, a scorching wind will, will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. So the Hebrew poetry is often written with an opening and a closing. It's very well structured. Then with a center, um, a center phrase or verse that centers the theme of the psalm. And the opening phrase of the psalm is, In the Lord I take refuge. And David uses God's personal name, Yahweh. In Yahweh I take refuge. It was very... David was on personal name terms with God, very intimate. And of course, the Jews later in, in Jewish history no longer use Yahweh, God's personal name, but Adonai, because it was understood to even presume to pronounce the holy name would be presumptuous and, and blasphemous. But Jesus used Abba, for God, for Yahweh, which was equally intimate. And uh, the Pharisees accused him of blasphemy by talking to God as Abba. So I have no qualms in talking to God on personal names. And what's interesting, David here, he starts off verse 1, In Yahweh, in you, Yahweh, I take refuge. And then the name Yahweh is mentioned in the center of the psalm. And then back again at the end of the psalm. For Yahweh is righteous. 
He loves justice and the upright will see his face. So we find, we take refuge in Yahweh and that of course immediately um, raises the connotation in the Jewish mind of the three cities of refuge. That when Israel entered the promised land, God uh, assigned three cities that people could run to when their enemies were chasing them. When their, when their life was threatened, they could run to the city of refuge. And so when our lives are being threatened, when things are falling apart, when there's all sorts of fear that dominates people's minds because of COVID, because of uh, looting and unrest, uh, what do we do? How do we respond? Where do we turn to? The, the inner voices of our emotions and the outer voices of society and people around us, they say, flee like a bird to the mountains. But David says, no ways. How can you say that to me? It's almost an insult because I choose to flee to God. I run to God who is my refuge. Yahweh, you are my refuge. You are my city, my rock of protection, my place of safety. So I'm not going to listen to the voices who say to me, run and flee. And you know, the, the phrase here, flee to the mountains, um, when Saul um, chased after David to kill him a second time, um, in 1 Samuel chapter 26, David says, the king of Israel has come out to look for me like a flea. You've come out to hunt me like a partridge in the mountains. So this idea of flee to the mountains is being hunted down. And uh, I know many of you, many of us, the, the past 10 days, and I know that the violence was particularly present in Hillcrest, Kloof area, um, Waterfall Mall was burnt and looted terribly. And uh, the, the fear, the confusion speaks all sorts of things to us and tells us to pack up and go and just leave. Where do we go? Because look, the wicked bend their bow. And just to say to you, what, is, what has happened in our nation the past 10 days has not been racially motivated. It's not a racial I issue as such. It's a political power issue of uh, the, the Zuma faction and protest to his arrest, basically trying to shift power and undermine Ramaphosa's power and shift power and so we need to understand it and see it for what it is. Prophetic spiritual eyes see the spiritual powers, the spiritual ideological powers behind what has happened. And they are bent on the destruction uh, to undermine uh, law and order, to destabilize and divide the nation and therefore shift power in their favor. And so it's the, it's the wicked who shoot from the shadows at the upright and hot and l destroy. You know, the power of darkness is at night time. And sadly, so much has happened that many of us in our communities have had to man roadblocks through the night and protect um, shopping centers and strategic places and entrances into homes because of all the fear of death and, and murder and violence that has come to us. And so David then asks the question, when the righteous, at least when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And that's the center of the psalm. That's in fact the key. And the foundations in many ways have been shaken and even destroyed. And that phrase actually is a reference to Psalm 82, when the foundations are shaken and destroyed. What can the righteous do? And the answer that David gives is not to give in to fear, is not to panic, is not to flee like a bird to the mountains or to pack up and go and to get out, out of this place. But the answer is in verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord is. Yahweh is in his holy temple. Yahweh, you are, are in your temple. You are on the throne. 
You are still in charge. You are in control of your universe. And that is not an, kind of a, an escape from reality by just looking up into some super spiritual warfare where we're caught up in a, in a bubble in heaven and we deny the painful reality of what's going on around us. You know, David and the Psalms represent a Hebraic worldview that is incredibly robust and honest with reality. Hebrew Psalms, laments, are not negative in that you get overcome by reality and you cry and you mourn and you turn inward in hopelessness. But neither is lament an escape from reality into the super spiritual bubble where God's on his own and and it's just God and me and the devil cannot touch me. Rather, the radical middle represented in the Hebraic worldview is the kingdom has come. God is active. He's on his throne. But the kingdom has not yet come because evil still rules. And there is this conflict of warfare in the middle. And the radical middle response is, look up because your redemption draws near. Look up and see God is on the throne. That God has and is and will defeat evil in all its forms. And that by looking up to God on the throne, we actually see what God is doing. Because God is not inactive in this. God has not, he doesn't sit passively on his throne and just observe. But God actually is involved in all of this. So from the biblical worldview, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, God works in all things for those who love Him. God works for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. God works in and through the righteous for good. And God works against the wicked in judgment to bring them to account and to discipline evil, and to punish evil, and restrain evil. So when it says, what can the righteous do when the foundations of society, the foundations of a nation, are not only being shaken, but actually are being destroyed? What can the righteous do? The alternative Hebrew uh, phrase or rendering, which is, which is legitimate in the Hebrew translation, if you look, if you have an NIV Bible in the margin, it'll give you a footnote that says, what is the righteous one doing? What can the righteous do? The alternative uh, rendering is, what is the righteous one? What is Yahweh doing? So how do we respond in times of extremity? We look up to see God on his throne. That's the first thing. We rebuke fear and we put fear aside And we settle ourselves with faith and looking to God. And then we see what is God doing in this? What is God doing through this? And that is the prophetic eyes to see where the Lord is active and what is God doing. As Jesus said, in fact, in Matthew um, chapter 5 and verse 8, He said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And it's actually... These Beatitudes, again, are rabbinical ways of teaching from Jewish wisdom literature, which comes from the Psalms and the Proverbs. And Jesus is quoting Psalms and Proverbs. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. It doesn't only mean um, they will see God in the sweet by and by once once we die. (laughs) But it means... Those who are pure in heart, the upright in heart, those who seek righteousness and truth, those who are right with God, who have purified their hearts through the blood of Jesus, through the forgiveness of sins, they see God in all things. No matter what happens in life, whatever challenges come our way, whatever crisis happens, God is not absent from it. God, in fact, works in and through it for our good if we love Him 
and we are called according to His purpose. God is sovereignly working out His purpose in life, in what happens daily in your life and my life, in your business life, in your family life, in your community, in, in Sarepta Church and in our nation. If we have eyes of faith to see where God is present and active. So the first thing is, what is the righteous one doing? Well, he's sitting on his throne. He's in charge of his universe. He knows what's going on. But then he's also engaged. And, and, and he's engaged in two ways, according to the psalm, as what David says. He works against the righteous to defeat the work of evil, um, the unrighteous, the wicked. To defeat the work of wickedness, the spirit that is at work in the children of disobedience. We, we don't fight against flesh and blood, as Paul says. The warfare, the spiritual warfare, the powers behind. We, we don't hate human beings. We don't curse human beings. We don't um, uh, retaliate and take up arms in protecting ourselves to kill other human beings. <laughs> Jesus said, if you take up the sword, you'll die by the sword. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but is against the powers behind that use human beings and use ideology and use the factions uh, um, to divide and to rule. And so God works to discipline and destroy the evil behind the, the wicked who are the instrument. And how evil has this been in South Africa where a power faction in protest at, at our ex-president, our corrupt ex-president, Jacob Zuma's imprisonment, that uses the poor and the desperate and the hungry, the unemployed in townships, to basically use them as cannon fodder for their own purposes of power to destabilize and divide the nation and shift political power towards their camp. That is the real evil of the evil that has worked in and through thousands, tens of thousands of people who looted. And of course, uh, that is the God is unmasking the true nature of evil that exploits um, vulnerable, hungry, unemployed people who are desperate for anything, for food, to go and to loot and to actually um, achieve the desire of destabilization, division, and a shift of power. God hates that. God will discipline that. God will judge that. God will bring it to account. Those who love violence, God will judge and destroy. In fact, David uses the phrase, from the book of Genesis, when God judges Sodom and Gomorrah for their sin and their evil, they, their cup of iniquity became full, and the judgment of God came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. God rained down coals of fire and burning sulfur upon them, and gave them a scorching wind to drink. Their cup was a scorching wind to drink. And it's the same phraseology. There is a time when God judges evil by unmasking evil, you know, it's interesting, Jesus defeated demons that inhabited people's bodies, people who are demonized, by unmasking. When evil is unmasked and it manifests itself, when Jesus taught in Mark chapter 1, the very first sermon Jesus taught when he began his ministry was in a synagogue, and as he read the scripture, there was such a unique authority upon his presence that evil could no longer hide, but manifested in the body of that man and screamed out and said, What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? We know who you are. And God pushes evil out and it manifests in the form of violence and tries to make a last stand. But God unmasks and manifests evil in order to judge it and bring it to account and to defeat it. So that is what God is doing according to the psalm. He doesn't sit passively on his throne, but his kingship, the kingdom of God breaks through 
to both discipline and judge evil, unmask and discipline it, but also to work with the righteous for the good of society. So it says that the Lord's on his throne. He looks over all the earth. He sees the heart of all human beings. And then David typically talks about the wicked and the righteous, these two categories of human beings. And the wicked are those who follow the ways of sin and the father of lies, the devil, and do his will um, on earth as it is in hell by perpetrating lies, deception, violence for purposes of power. But for the righteous, God looks upon the righteous, those who have been put right with God by faith in his covenant, the new covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ. And God looks at the righteous. He sees their hearts. In fact, it says in the book of Chronicles that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for those who are upright in heart, those who love righteousness, who love justice as opposed to violence. You know, justice and righteousness in the Hebrew come from the same root word, tzedak. And the word tzedak... Basically, righteousness is right, right standing with God, right way of living, right way of thinking, right way of speaking, right way of behaving. Yahweh, verse 7, David says, for Yahweh is righteous. Yahweh is tzedak. Right? Yahweh thinks rightly, behaves rightly, speaks his word is righteous. And we who are made righteous in Christ and followers of God through faith in Jesus, we learn to live rightly, doing the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. We do God's bidding, God's will, God's purpose by, 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 by thinking God's thoughts, by seeing from God's point of view, by speaking what God would speak. We don't curse and swear and fill the air, the air and the spirit world with words that are negative, full of fear and fear mongering and saying, flee, pack up and go. It's not worth it. South Africa is going down. It's going to be a basket case. All the unbelief, all the talk that just carries on filling the air with negativity. We are different. We are different. We think the way God thinks. We see the way God sees. We are seated with Him in heavenly places at His right hand with Jesus at the throne. And we see from God's point of view and we think kingdom thoughts. We speak kingdom words. We are people who are different. We breathe the oxygen of heaven and we fill the foul air of South Africa with God's oxygen. We speak with his words, and we give life, was in the power of the tongue is both life and death. So the Lord is righteous. He looks at the righteous, and he shows himself strong on behalf of the righteous. He works in and through the righteous for justice. And justice is the right treatment of one another. The, it's treating people with such utter dignity and respect, because each human being is the very living image of God. So when you meet someone in the street, even a person who perpetrated uh, violence and looting, you know, many, I believe, many Christians from places came and looted. Christians looted. And it's our own brothers and sisters who are desperate and hungry and go and steal food just to survive and feed their kids. What? What, what a mess we live in in South Africa. So just to say to you, justice is treating even our brothers and sisters who were so desperate that perhaps they went and got stuff for their own survival. We treat each person with dignity and respect as the image of God. Jesus even teaches us to love our enemy. So justice, the Lord loves righteousness. He loves justice, right fair treatment of people. The upright will see his face. That's how David ends up the psalm. And let me end up with this. So God is on his throne. 
He sees the wicked and what happens and he works against them for to judge and discipline evil. He sees the upright and hot and works with them to bring right way of thinking, right way of living, responding the right way to give hope and to restore and rebuild society because the upright will see his face. And that last phrase is a phrase that was used in Hebrew, um, in the Hebrew Testament of people who came into the presence of the king to see the king's face. It's the manifest presence of kingship, of the rule of the king. And if you were allowed into the king's presence to see his face, you were, you were truly favored and blessed in those days. So may the Lord make his face to shine upon us. May he be gracious to us. May He turn His face towards us. Panim, God's face, is His manifest presence. God's kingship breaks through in our life and in our affairs to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. That His will is done on our piece of earth as it is in heaven. And that's the promise of God. Yahweh works with the righteous, in and through the righteous, to manifest His presence, that His face shines upon us and restores and rebuilds and makes whole and creates shalom society. Not only a just and fair society where we treat each other with dignity and respect, but a, but a shalom society of compassion and mercy whereby we feed one another, we clean up the mess, we go and we build houses and we share resources and create good society because good society is the will of God for South Africa. So dear friends, let me pray for you. Lord, we pray in Kosi Sikelele i Africa. God bless Africa. God bless South Africa. Lord, we pray, bring an end to the wars and the violence. Bring an end to the hatred. Bring an end to the division. Bring an end to all the tears. Wipe up the tears. All the brokenness. God, heal and restore. Let your kingdom come. Let your face shine upon us, O oh God, individually, as families, as businesses, as churches, as a nation. Manifest your presence by defeating the evil that's at work here and establishing righteousness and justice, we pray. Oh, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on our piece of earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Our Father who is in the heavens, hallowed be your name. Amen. Thank you so much for receiving the Word of God through me. And may God bless you guys. Love you very much.